You are back in the stew with Deontay and Jared, and we have a special guest today, a producer for ESPN 1000, a former producer for the Howard Stern Show, and Mike and Mike in the morning, we have Chicago area native, J.R. Strauss. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me on today. How you doing? Pretty good. Happy to be here in the stew. This is quite a uh, cool setup you guys have here. What brings you in? Uh, just hanging out with you guys, talk a little bit about how I got started in the industry. Uh, as you may or may not know, I went to school here, so I actually graduated from here and I taught here for eight years as well. So it's nice to see this program developing. Yeah. Yeah. So is it a lot of changes? Since uh, you were here? a lot of changes. Yeah. Everything's been upgraded and things look good. You know, a nice fresh coat of paint doesn't hurt. New address. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it seems like you guys are getting some new technology in here. I'm looking at all these cameras here. Good stuff here. How do you guys like being here? Oh, it's great. I've learned more. I've been to a couple of traditional schools before that had media programs and I was trying to get my feet like set in some of that. Uh, honestly, it doesn't compare to this place. Actually, when you want to like get into this business, this is a perfect place to come to. Right. So I started here. I went to the Lombard campus in like the mid 90s. And part of the requirement, as you know, is to get an internship. So I got the internship with the Howard Stern show. It mm-hmm. was like six weeks into school. I, I was applying for internships before they even told us to do it. That was the whole reason I came here was to get my foot in the door in radio. So I did it. I was offered that job. I actually applied at a, both the sports radio stations, heard nothing. Really? Uh, got the Howard Stern gig because I had to be downtown by 4 a.m. No one wanted to get up that early. Mm-hmm. Well, I did it to get my foot in the door. Turned out the producer that I was working for wound up leaving, and they handed me the job because I already knew how to do it. So I had a job, and I was employed and getting paid even before I was done with this program. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's, that's good. So that's how you have to do it is you have to be aggressive. You can't wait for things to come to you. You have to actually go and get it. Yeah, you, right? have, to, yeah, you have to really go out there, like really grab it because like, this is a really competitive industry. Absolutely. And there's so many people who tell you what you can and can't do. When I told people that my ultimate goal was to work at ESPN, I get that look, right, that – you know how hard that is to do. Right. Like, well, sure. I do know how hard that is to do. And maybe I could be the one to do it. Who knows? I mean, I didn't start there. That's, right. I, I, you have to wind up getting to your destination. It's not always where you want to be at first, but I think being a self starter and knowing what you want to do or where you want to end up is huge, especially when you come to this program. And the work ethic you got to have is you got to have a pretty high one because a lot of stuff that this, like these jobs entail, like you're working almost constantly. It's around the clock. So you're obviously monitoring what's happening in the sports world on a daily basis. But when you're doing morning show, half of the gig is getting there on time. Mm -hmm. I I can't tell you how many people I know that have lost a gig because they overslept. I've been doing this gig for 25 years at this time in the morning and I've never been late. So it's still 4 a.m. is the start time? I mean, I'm in my car at 4. I'm in my chair by a quarter to 5. I've got a show that starts at 7, and I do a lot of production. I've got an hour and a half of production before a meeting at 6.15. Oh, my God. So, and then the show goes 7 to 10. You know, I chop up some audio, and I'm out the door. It's 10.30 in the morning. Dang. So that could be kind of fun, right? But it's not It's not all I did, right? I told you right. I taught here. Mm-hmm. This was while I was working part-time at ESPN, so I was juggling teaching here, you know, working part-time in the mornings before we had our local morning show and developing different projects along the way just to keep myself involved. One thing turns into another. When I was here doing uh, this program, I put together something just like this called Strauss Project, Mm -hmm. which turned into an interview-based program. One of the TV people who I worked with here, his name is Jeff Conway. Is he still here, by the way? Great guy. Yes, he is, actually. So Jeff knew that we were doing this together, was working with a TV station that needed programming. And before you know it, Strauss Project was on in 1.2 million homes on Comcast. Oh, my God. (laughs) Just because of a project we started. You put the material out there, and if you do it right, people are going to notice. Right. So that's my – That's if if you can take away anything from me, the first thing I would tell you is to be on time, the best ability, availability, Mm -hmm. right? But you also have to be annoyingly persistent, To the point where people either give you something or tell you to go away. So that's what I did, and here I am. So speaking of the Strauss Project, uh, is that still actually going on, and what exactly is it? So it's an interview-based program uh, that I did with musicians that I wanted to talk to myself. It was based on my interests. I picked the musical genre I like. I got some students that were interested in camera experience. We took them all out to a live event. They shot footage that was amazing for them to get access to for their reels. And at the same time, I'm doing interviews with musicians that I've always wanted to talk to. I put together a media crew, and boom, we're a media crew. Nobody told us any different, and we did it. We interviewed 20 people in a weekend and published them all. 
And people take notice. This stuff got national traction. It's just because we're doing it the right way. All the things that you learn from this place, if you do them the right way, you'll see the results. Yeah. Uh, and if, like So about this, like but everything mm-hmm. you did, you picked the music genre you wanted with the company that's uh, Strauss Project. You did everything you wanted to do. When it came to finding out that this was your career path, was this something that you already had like pre-planned? Or was this something that was kind of like almost happenstance? So I'm one of those famous people that has a face for radio, right? I mean, look at this beard, right? <laughs> but so... But I was never comfortable in front of the camera until I had to do it. I was forced to do it. My talent didn't show up and nobody knew it as well as I did. I said, fine, I'll do it. We'll try it. We'll see what happens. Mm. Well, I did it. You know, my camera people turned and looked at me and they're like, holy cow, you don't do this. You should do this all the time. And we're off and running. It's not something I intended to do, but I tried it and wound up being okay at it. So here we are. I mean, I did not plan this. No, I did not plan on putting together a group of students and being on Comcast and having that turn into my rock station gig. I work at ESPN, and then my other gig on the weekends is I work at a rock station. How do you get a rock station gig when you work at a sports station? Right. When I was teaching, mm-hmm. I told every one of my students, and I will tell one of you this too right now, one of you watching, you're going to give me a job. Somebody out there is going to give me a job. I can't hire myself. Somebody is going to have to give me a job. And hopefully, all of you are successful enough where it's one of you. And that's exactly what happened. One of my students needed a tech that knew how to run remotes and a weekend overnight jock. Guess who we called? That student. (laughs) Ta-da. And here we are. It's all about connections and connecting with people and putting yourself out there and just doing it. And you're in the stew with Jared, Deontay, and I guess J.I. So... Is it music or sports? Like, what is your passion or your favorite? Yes. The answer is yes. <laughs> yes. Because both. I don't have to choose one. Okay. I can do both. I can have my hand in both worlds. And that's okay. You don't have to choose one thing. I was fortunate enough to get a job in both fields. But you can dabble around in both of them until you figure out what you like. And go back and forth from one to the other. And use them to supplement each other. Again, if your goal is to be a talk show host, then does it matter who you talk to? I can talk to you all day, Mm -hmm. right? But I can also talk to people that I'm interested in as well. Yeah, that's why this forum was created, and it's great. Uh, So when you were, like, climbing the ladder in your career, what did you look at as, like, was kind of like a big break moment for you? Was Um, it – was it it getting to ESPN 1000 or was it, like, getting the Stern gig or Mike and Mike? I would say getting to ESPN 1000 because, as I said previously, I – did not get any response when I tried to get in there and I kept trying to get in there and I did not get any callbacks. Mm. <laughs> this is a true story. When I was working at WCKG with the Howard Stern show and I wound up working there for five and a half years, some of the people I met along the way had a fantasy baseball league and I'm a sports fan, mm-hmm. right? I'm working at a music station and I'm a sports fan. They're like, Hey, we need another guy for our fantasy baseball league. I said, yeah, that sounds great. I show up. It's all radio people. In my fantasy baseball league from different stations, and there just happens to be a guy who works at ESPN. Okay. Cool. I'll put that in my pocket. I'll save that for later. A couple years down the line, we go on. We meet every year for this fantasy baseball league. And one year, he looks across from me, and he goes, hey, you're a sports guy. My morning show person's leaving. Do you want an opportunity to run Mike and Mike in the morning? Wow. wow. That's a huge <laughs> bombshell. <laughs> um. Yes. Because that was like, that was the, and yes, that was the biggest national sports show. Yeah. So I was, this was 2003. Okay. So I started the next week and I have been at ESPN ever since. That's incredible. But it's all by putting yourself out there. Did I want to get up at four o'clock in the morning? No. Did I want to work on a show that maybe I'd never heard before in Howard Stern? True. I'd never heard it before I worked on it. No, I didn't want to work on it. I wanted to work on a rock show or I wanted to work on a sports show. Or I wanted to do my own thing, but I took it because I knew it was my foot in the door. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, because, and like you said, like this job is very fluid. You're going to do almost everything. But I'm at the point where I can do almost everything. Right. And that's the idea is you get the opportunity to do things. It's not that you have to do something. If you have to do it, you're barking up the wrong tree. It's getting the opportunity to do and talk about what you love on a daily basis. So how was the transition from Howard Stern to Mike and Mike? Oh, it was amazing. 
I mean, it, it, again, working with Howard on a syndicated show, so it sounds like I was sitting next to Howard Stern. I don't want to give that impression. I was running the show in Chicago. It was on an hour delay. There were certain things that we had to do, but I did work closely with the network and getting things done. Did I talk to Howard once on the air? Yes, that's a story for another time of in the stew, not this one. <laughs> Okay. But I wound up being at ESPN and being behind the scenes and not getting an opportunity to open my mouth and talk, as you can tell, something I do pretty well. Okay, I can talk, as you can tell. We're, what, 20 minutes into this puppy. I've maybe taken three breaths. <laughs> I don't mind being behind the scenes and giving other people good lines to read if they can deliver them. I love writing good lines for people. And that's just it, being part of it, being part of the show, surrounding yourself with the people and the things that you want to do, that will get you to where you want to go. Gotcha. So when you were working on Mike and Mike, like what, what was your what was your role there? Like what were you doing exactly? I'm basically just running a board, running local commercials, making sure that, you know, our logs are all straight. There were national requirements that, you know, Greeny would run, you know, a local commercial and we'd have to make sure that it was aired properly or all the pronunciations were right for, you know, something local. You don't know how to pronounce local street names and if you're not from Chicago, right? right? I mean, put displays in front of somebody and watch them freak out, mm -hmm. right? So again, like just making sure that all the little details and the, you know, I's were dotted and the T's were crossed. And then I'd whip out of that show and come down here and teach a class at 930. Gotcha. That's crazy. Like you were really just a workhorse. Well, but it's doing, surrounding yourself and doing what you love. It's not, I mean, is this work? No, it's talking about Talking about sports and music, like this is what we do in our free time, right? Mm -hmm. So to get paid to do it, yeah, I'm going to get up early to it, do it. It's a dream come true. Right. And you'll make those sacrifices. Absolutely. Because it's really like you're, man, you're not working at all. Right. So what what came after Mike and Mike? What show was it after um, that? So we were running Mike and Mike syndicated for, wow, a good 15 years after I were there. And then Mike and Mike had that big blow up where they kind of had a breakup. Yeah. And then it was mm -hmm. Golik and Wingo. And now we run a national morning show, uh, Keyshawn, J. Will, and Max. Mm -hmm. But we got a local show for the first time in, gosh, 20 years on our frequency at ESPN 1000. It's Cap and Jay Hood. Mm -hmm. And that's the show that I work on currently. I'm the technical producer of that morning show. It means I'm downtown by 445 every morning. It's the shift that I have grown accustomed to love. Even though it's crazy thinking about waking up in the dark, there is something to be said for being done before noon every day. So I listen to Cap and Jay Hood. Okay. How is it like really working in close quarters with Cap? Uh, Cap's great. He's a great guy. And and we give him a lot of flack. And that's part of the reason that he's so great is that he takes it, right? He can take the flack. And it's not easy when everyone's picking on you and backing you into a corner to be able to laugh at yourself and have a good attitude about that. Cap's great about those things. And pairing him with, with Jay Hood, it's great. They are two people from two totally different worlds. And I think it really works. We have a lot of fun on that show in the morning. You're in the stew with Deontay, Jared, and our guest, JR. Uh, now, you worked with so out of all these jobs, you've had many. You've had many of them. Which one would you say is like your favorite one so far? What's been your best experience? Because I know you you say you love like just about everything you've done. What was there's got to be one that stands above the others. So there the opportunity to get to talk to musicians and and get inside information. Like if you had a favorite band and then you were able to hang out with that band and then find out like how they were recording their next album and they were letting you in on all those little details, that would be cool, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a moment that I really embrace is that's kind of happened for me with a band that I really like. That's a lot of fun. But everyone's got those moments that's personal to them. It may not be such a big deal or, or a huge accomplishment or a milestone, but it's those little moments along the way that you're like, wow, I'm really doing this. Like this is... This is so much fun. I can't imagine doing anything else. It's like one of those pinch me, I'm drinking yeah. moments. Yeah, I'm actually getting paid to do this. Are you kidding <laughs> so me? So what, what was the, the first band that actually had that wow factor that you got a chance um, to? So uh, the band is called Queensryche, and I'm going to guess that you guys are probably not familiar with it. You look a little younger. <laughs> I've heard and maybe, Okay, so they were popular in the late 80s and early 90s, and it was one of those situations where I went through their Facebook page and asked them for an interview, not thinking that they would say yes, because I didn't want to pay to get into their concert. <laughs> and, and they said yes. And I was like, uh, what? You're serious? They're like, yeah, I was six o'clock. And I was like, uh, okay. And then I had to go find recording equipment because I didn't have any. And I was like, uh, I need to borrow some from the school, please. Uh, and went and recorded an interview with this band. I walked into their their bus and they were all sitting there waiting for me. All five of them. I was like, 
Uh, You're just like, I can't believe this I, is I, I'm not really ready for this. Like, I, I did not know that I was going to get every single band member there. So I stood there on their bus and held court. It was fantastic. That's awesome. And it was audio only. I didn't have a video camera yet. This was the genesis of Strauss Project. I was like, we, we got to do that again. That was so much fun. Like, I just talked my way into that. We, we got to do that again. And that's, so we did. That's incredible. That, 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 like, seriously, that's like what, when everyone, anyone gets in this business, you're kind of hoping for that moment. And, but like, you don't get what you don't ask for. Exactly. All I did was ask. Yeah, you had to be yeah. assertive. All I did was ask. I did say please. But all I did was ask. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Still have manners. That's good. <laughs> so who, who was like the most famous band that you interviewed? Um... The most famous band I've interviewed. I talked to uh, Hall of Fame guitarist Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick. Uh, Familiar. I'm from uh, Rockford. Okay. So Rockford guy. Uh, last month. He's pretty famous. I don't know necessarily that that everybody is so famous. Obviously, being on the air with Howard was – was he's probably the most famous person I've spoken to. But the, the fun thing is the people that they bring into the ESPN studios. I mean, Mike Tyson came walking through the studios. I stopped him for a selfie. Like, that's – that's like one of the craziest things I've ever done. Stepped in front of Mike Tyson. But that actually happened. The Stanley Cup comes into the studio and there's me and Coach Q in the Stanley Cup. Like just the opportunities that you get to be around on a daily basis. That's the fun part. So when you were growing up, I mean, you're a Chicago area native mm-hmm. sports fan, big sports fan. Yeah, Cub fan. <laughs> Cub, oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, Cub fan working for the White Sox station. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, you know, you don't get to pick where you work either all yeah, the time. Right? Benedict I mean, Arnold over here. It's cool. And notice it says home of the White Sox. It doesn't say I'm a fan of the White Sox, right? And, and, and that's all part of it too. You got to be able to have fun with it. Yeah, you got to be able to laugh at yourself because it's not going to always go the way that you want it to. Yeah, exactly. Just in general. So uh, I'm a White Sox fan. Okay. Uh, I don't hold it against you. That's fine. We, we can still be we're friends. We're good. Yeah, we're good. We're good friends. Uh, so. What would you like to see with your Cubs going forward? I know they're in like oh, a, a spend rebuild. Spend some damn mode. money. Jeez. <laughs> oh, my God. Spend some damn money. I mean, you know, you're the third largest market in the in the country. I'm, I don't want to hear about your biblical losses in the marquee network. Yes. I don't want to hear about any of that crap. 15th in the payroll. Go get me a $30 million player. Go get me a couple of them while you're at it. And maybe a couple starters. Look, the farm system's got to be re- restocked. They're not going to be good for the next couple of years. I don't want them to spend recklessly, but they need to get some people in here so we can start attracting some talent. Do you think Wilson should be traded? He'll be gone by the All-Star break. Do you think so? Yes. I mean, how can he not right now, especially given like how well he's playing? I mean, th- there's no reason to hang on to him, especially if you're not competing. Mm-hmm. He could be an asset to a competing team for sure. I was surprised that he actually stuck around when they did the, the overhaul. Well, I mean, if they're paying you, you're showing up too, right? Yeah. I mean, that's how it works. Now, the White Sox... Uh, I mean, they've had some tough breaks lately. They're scuffling around 500. Everyone thought they were going to run away with the division, and now they're looking up at the Twins. Well, I mean, they've also been they've been dinged up by a bunch of injuries. Uh, right, start, but that's... To get out of the gates. So, in contrast, if you look at the 2016 champion Cubs, they had five starters start 30 games apiece, right? And that's... When you see it all lining up and all those little breaks happening, you're like, wow, this could really happen. It seems like it's the other way for the White Sox, doesn't it? Everybody's getting hurt. Just when somebody gets back, they get dinged again. Another pitcher down. You know, I mean, Lance Lynn back, you know, let's see what he can do and, mm-hmm. and if he gets his stamina back. But it's like all these guys just coming back. And now Cease was great. And now the last couple starts, eh, been a little rocky. you know, it's not so much. So up. it's like nobody can put it all together at the same time. And that has to happen for an extended period if you want to win. It- I don't think they're necessarily out of it, though. Like, as much as I just don't care about the White Sox, I do watch them a lot, given, sure. given the classes we're taking. We have to follow them quite closely. Right. But you look at the talent all the way across the board. Like, it is it is still one of the most talented rosters in the entire league. And I think it's just a matter of time before it really just gets clicking because the talent is just going to be too great to not. And I Fair enough. I'll agree with that. But then let's look at them compared to the AL West and the AL East. Do you think they're as strong as the strongest teams in those divisions? I don't. So that's where you're competing. Great, you may win your division, but if you're a one and done, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, what are we talking about here? Maybe you should have gone out and signed Korea for those three years. Yeah, that. Oh, jeez. Now the bat would look nice right now since they're not scoring more than four runs a game, more than you know what, forty percent of the time. That left-handed bat wouldn't hurt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. You're in the stew with Jared, Deontay, and I guess Jr. So let's transition from baseball and get to a little football. All right. The Bears. Yeah. What, what's your take on the moves? <sighs> well. I just don't think they have the talent. Look, I, I I know that offensive line is a hard position to staff, but you're going to have to protect Fields to see what you have, and this is the year that you're going to have to figure out whether he's the one 
or not. I know the offensive line isn't ideal, but he's got to show you that leadership and that flash of brilliance. The worst thing that could happen to the Bears this year is not knowing what Justin Fields is at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the biggest question, Mark. Especially when you bring in Luke Getze, who was the quarterback's coach in Green Bay. You're making him fill in a pretty significant role trying to basically unlock Justin Fields with this team and seeing what they can do. I'm looking at the Bears season this year as a bridge year. I don't think we should expect great results in terms of wins and losses. But as the year goes on, if it's the finer details I think you need to pay attention to. How disciplined are they going to be? Is it going to be a 180 from the Nagy era? Are they at least trending in the right direction with how the offense is operating under Getze? How does the defense look now with Eberflus? Because he's kind of bringing back that old Tampa 2, cover 2 system that Lovey has and is still revered in this in this, uh, in this city. So if you're looking for wins and losses results, I don't think that's how we should be looking at it. We should just look at the minor improvements and see if Justin Fields does take a step north and make yeah. sure he's doing something. Yeah, no, I agree. We we sit here in, in sports radio, it's so reactionary, right? Yeah. You, you try to base something off of a quote or a practice or results or something that you see a glimpse of without seeing the entire big picture. You got to let the process play out. Mm-hmm. You got to see what these guys do for the entire year. The learning process takes time. You can't just judge it in one small window, right? You have to look at it in the overall. So I think that's really important. And like you said, yeah, seeing what Getsy does and the fact that, you know, yeah, this guy's coaching the quarterbacks in Green Bay. He may know, you know, or excuse me, and, uh, he, he was working with Rodgers, yes, right? Yes. So, I mean, again, like it, it's it, when you've got a quarterback that that's good, that is that good, and he works that closely with him, you have to at least give him an opportunity to trust him working with your rookie or, mm-hmm. or your or your younger players. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I agree that, uh, you know, it's a, a bridge here for Justin. It's a lot that's going to be critiqued with him. Uh, offensive line is going to be completely brand new, so hopefully he can stay healthy the entire year so that we can get some type of visual. Now, uh, what about the secondary? <laughs> I like the improvements. I do too, but – you know, again, if they're going to be just chasing all day, I mean, I, I mean, I'm throwing on that secondary until they prove they can stop it, right? right? Yeah. All day because it's revamped the, the, at least a whole half of it mm-hmm. with Kyler Gordon and with Jaquan Brisker. It should being be injected. interesting. I, you know, again, I, I like some of the younger kids coming in, but I, I, I want to see it. Look, it's going to take time, right? I mean, you got to learn the scheme, you got to learn everything. Mm-hmm. So, how quickly they pick up the the, the scheme and, and and the defense, I think, is going to be really important as well. How did you like the Bears draft, given what they had at first and then basically what they ended up with? It's so hard to judge, right? right? It's it's so hard to judge. I like that they got more selections. I mm-hmm. thought that was the right way to go, trading down, um, getting more. There's a lot of holes on this team to fill, and you don't always hit on your draft picks. So the more the merrier. I'm all for more. Absolutely. So how many wins you giving them this season? Can I, can I say six and a half? Can I say that? I mean, they're right. They're right there on the precipice, right? I mean, six, seven. I, if I'm in Vegas right now and you ask me to lay the over on, the over under, I think it's seven, right? Mm-hmm. I honestly don't know where I'm going. That's why there's all those tall buildings out there. I'm hammering the under. Yeah, yeah. I'm hammering the under. Yeah. So the, the key really is going to be that stretch. I think it's like what Atlanta and Detroit and something else. Look, if they can't beat Atlanta, uh, we we got some problems. We're I think that'll be, that'll be that'll be that'll be a good <laughs> measuring sticks. If if they can't beat Atlanta, they'll split with the, with the Lions. Now, when you were working with when you were working with Howard Stern, mm-hmm. like there had to have been some rather enjoyable experiences, some funny experiences. So, any stories about that? So being in Chicago, right, mm-hmm. and he's in New York, I didn't get the visual that ah. everybody got, right? So everyone's like, "Oh, strippers and this and that." And it wasn't like that. <laughs> it was me in a room with um, like a clock and a lot of math problems. Really, it's it's that's really not that exciting. So, gotcha. um, it, it it was fun to be a part of it because it was. I'm sitting there listening to it and just being a part of that wackiness was just just wild. You're going to pay me to sit here and listen to this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, that that was that was a lot of fun. But uh, something serious that happened while I was working there was uh, 9-11. Oh, so okay. that was crazy in that obviously it happened in New York. My host is sitting in New York. Right. And uh, if you ever have the opportunity to go back on YouTube and listen to Howard Stern live on 9-11, I highly recommend it. Uh, he was brilliant that day. He was like a traffic director. Like he was like a local radio host. Like, hey, there's shelter at this church. Like, you know, this road is closed. Like all traffic's being diverted this way. He was like the community leader. Like he dropped all of his BS and just was trying to help out in any way he could. It was uh, terrifying and fascinating radio. A lot of it, like Stern's content, it's not for everybody, especially probably back at that time mm-hmm. too, when he was still pretty raw. Yeah. Um, 
he he has always been a master of his platform, though. And to have a guy like that that knows how to work radio, knows how to kind of work the public and get them to kind of rally in some way in, in an event like that, like that, that's that's extremely impressive. And he, to be a part of that, that's that's pretty unique. He is one of the best interviewers I've ever heard. And that's because he makes his subject so comfortable. All the wacky stuff, the balonians and strippers, all that, you can put all that to the side. Mm-hmm. He is as solid of an interviewer as there is out there. You think he's better than Letterman? No. I no. love Letterman. Obviously, that's, I mean, I look like him. But no, I, 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 uh, Letterman and Stern and, you know, th- there's a handful of others that you can just sit and watch them interview people because they're so good at it. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. So, and that's an art that takes practice. It does. It yeah. does. And it, those, it's something to kind of revere. Like uh, Conan O'Brien was always one that I always enjoyed. And I always think, I always thought that he made it very accessible for w- whatever guests to just get comfortable. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, and a brilliant writer wrote five seasons of The Simpsons. Simpsons? Come on. I mean, I'm genius. <laughs> so we got to get to the Bulls before, you know, we, we get out of here. Our time okay. is running short. So, okay. Uh, Middle of the road team. Next. <laughs> that quick? Just that quick? That quick? What about Zach? The, the Zach's max gone. contract. Zach's going. I, I think he's going. I mean, I, there's, there's a lot of money to be left on the table, but oh, look, I'm shaking your head over here. Camera guy over here is mad at me. That called middle of the road team. Who are they beating? Who are they? What? Come on, tell me where they're going in the future. <laughs> I mean, you, you don't think that that it could be maybe a, a player or two that the the season Zach and, and Demar had together. Could be attractive to somebody. Do you think else? you're going to get that season out of tomorrow next year? Um, I mean, it's possible. You can hit repeat. Do you Try. think Zach's going to be happy if you get that season out of tomorrow next year? Now that's the question, right? These that's two the got to play together, right? right. And yeah. Zach likes being the alpha, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. now you got everyone yelling tomorrow, 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 right? So how does that blend? How does that play? There's there's something to be said about being the man somewhere versus being second fiddle. These guys have giant egos. The money sometimes isn't enough. He may want a change of scenery. I don't have any information, but there's all these rumors out there right now. You saw TMZ just accost him about Los Angeles recently. There's rumors about Portland. I don't know what's going to happen. He'd leave a lot of money on the table if he left, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. Do you think a sign and trade with uh, AD is something that's possible? I do, but I heard an interesting factoid this morning in that with the sign and trade, it's the sign sal- it's the salary that he's got now. So it would be the 18 mil mm-hmm. versus the max. So this, the money doesn't match up. So it would have to be it would have to be something different. I don't think it could be for AD straight up. I'm curious how how that would go. But even wanting to be the the alpha, you go to Los Angeles. LeBron is there, but he could play a side alongside LeBron. Like that actually works. Think about the two of them playing together. That actually works. And LeBron, he may not be long for LA either, right? I mean, he wants to play with his kid. Whoever drafts his kid, that's where LeBron's going to wind up going. True. True. So he Cleveland. may not be long. Well, it could be. Cleveland. He may not be long for LA either, and then that leaves. Zach out there, shining star, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could on, happen. On a bad team when LeBron leaves. Yeah, he's still in L.A. being the man. He's got the Hollywood good looks, too. Right? Like, and, I mean, or you could be in Chicago and you could be middle of the road and be out first round. Sorry, bud. <laughs> 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 All right, JR. Uh, we want to say thank you for joining us today for this interview. Uh, it was incredible. Thank you for telling us your experiences. I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. We, we might need you to come back and sit in on a class or two if you had time in your busy schedule to, to I, drop some knowledge. I'd love that. Thank you. And I wouldn't mind hanging out in the stew again. Oh, definitely. We'll definitely have you All back. Right. Definitely. Thanks, guys. You're in the stew with Deontay and Jared. been in turmoil. Many have lost jobs. Businesses have closed. Media is there 24-7. Do you have what it takes to be a part of the media industry? Call Illinois Media School today and start training for hundreds of media positions. There are no excuses. We offer virtual courses and flexible schedules. Call Illinois Media School and you can graduate as a media professional in just eight months. Call now or visit beonair.com. 331-215-4762. What is it that separates the average human from the extraordinary one? It's passion. Passion allows you to go above and beyond the call of duty. Passion turns an ordinary workspace into a playground. If your passion is TV and radio broadcasting, your playground is the Illinois Media School. 
It's not your average swing set and monkey bars. The Illinois Media School provides hands-on broadcast training and fully equipped radio and TV studios. The instructional staff consists of broadcast professionals with many years of broadcast experience. It includes local on-air radio and TV personalities. Upon graduation, students are well prepared for entry-level positions in the broadcast industry. It's time for you to become extraordinary. Pursue your passion at the Illinois Media School. Visit today at beonair.com. Do you have what it takes for a career in media? If you have a passion for it, either on camera or behind the scenes, Illinois Media School can train you in just eight short months to finally work in the field you've always dreamed of. TV and radio, music, social media, and so much more. Get paid to create. Learn from the pros and visit beonair.com. With flexible class schedules, hands-on training, and financial aid for those who qualify. There's a reason thousands have come here to start their career in media. Get started now by visiting us online at beonair.com or call 331-215-4762.